Hello, everybody. God bless you. Thank you all for being here. It is lovely to see you. Uh, for those that don't know me because you've just maybe clicked on something that you thought was interesting and wondered why the guy wasn't moving, uh, my name's Ed Trevers. I'm an Anglican priest. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and his. I am the rector at St. Margaret of Scotland in Halifax, and I've just noticed that my beard is wild at the moment. Um, I've had a fairly long day today. I was coaching some basketball. I was coaching my youngest son uh, play basketball in a couple of games today uh, and getting ready for this service and uh, doing some other work. Anyhow, it is good to see you all. Thank you all for being here. I love being here with you. I hope you can see me. I hope you can hear me. Um, and all the other things that I'm supposed to be hoping for in a, in a moment like this. But looking at myself, and I'm noticing that it kind of looks like you know maybe maybe it's time to maybe it's time to give uh, give the beard a a little pruning. Anyhow, with all that being said, hey Tene, good to see you. And Josh is here. Canadian Anglican is here. Just finished uploading some videos on my Christian journey. Ooh, very good. Good to see it. Uh, Omar Stubbs is here, and Mama Sita is here, and Dana is here. Uh, Anne P. Leone, hello from Toronto. Hello from, good morning from Melbourne, SC says. Well, good morning to you in Melbourne and to all of other folks that are going to be watching from Melbourne. And um, uh, I want to say a a Abignail uh, and um, New Zealand and Japan and all those other folks that are out there in the, on the, on the, in the Pacific. And then we've got the folks, I mean, it's just great. Having, it's, it's really cool that we can have church together. Um, that we can have church together from all over the world. Like, I'll tell you, you know, between between you and I, and I don't know how I would ever do this. As a matter of fact, I watched a, a televangelist that I might speak about later. I watched a televangelist um, do this thing where he was trying to lay hands on people through the TV screen. So you say, you know, touch my hand, touch my hand. And his hand was just dripping in oil. And, and to me, that, that sort of, that sort of uh, stinks of I am somehow the conduit. If, if, I, if you have to touch my hand, then I am somehow the conduit for you to God. I, I am the conduit through which you'll be healed. I'm the conduit through, through which you'll be blessed. I'm the conduit through which God will speak. And that's, ne that's not, I don't believe that's the case. Um, I don't believe that any human being has, has, uh, has that responsibility. I don't believe any human being has been given that, that, that role. I think that's exactly why Jesus came, to be honest. But anyhow, I, one of my dreams would be trying to figure out how we can all have communion together. How can we all break bread together? Now, we've talked about maybe doing something in the fall. We talked about that last year. And, you know, maybe that's, a, maybe that's something we can do. But how could we do communion together, like, from where we are? <sighs> I'll figure it out. Technology, right? Maybe we'll get to the place like Star Trek where I just have to push a button and communion will appear where you are, a little cup of wine and a little wafer. It'd be cool. Anyhow, I'm really glad to see everybody from all over the place being here. Uh, Rock Mumbles, hello, Church Without Walls, family, peace, love, and understanding. Amen. Thank you very much, Rock Mumbles, for your for your great generosity. That's lovely of you. Um, Alwyn and Hammer is here. Happy early, uh, happy early, Holly. Happy early. Uh, Holy Week, Happy Purnam, uh, Ramadan Mubarak, um, Stay Groovy Duncan. <laughs> well, we, we got to make sure we cover all the bases, right? I, I especially like the Stay Groovy Duncan. Uh, yeah, this is, we're coming up on Holy Week, and it is, um, I, I suspect Holy Week is like grading week for teachers. It's, it's a big week. It's a big week coming up. Anyhow, uh, decoy tiger, uh, tiger paw. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited that my brother is coming home today. Yay. That's awesome. Congratulations. Uh, Steph is here. Steph says, hello, Ed and company. Just, uh, just felt tonight how much I needed this outstanding place with all your friendly and loving people. This place is so good. Pleased to be here. 
uh, like is of course pressed. Please hit like, hit subscribe, hit share, copy the link, do all the things, the notification bell, all that stuff. Hit all that stuff and uh, and that'll be cool. Uh, Folk the Forest says, good evening, dear community. And Ape Mix says, hello from Pennsylvania. Well, hello to you, Folk of the Forest, and hello to you in Pennsylvania, Ape Mick. Glad to see you. Uh, Midnight Man is here. And Susan is here, also from Pennsylvania. And Ruth is here from Nebraska. Uh, Kip is here. And Steve is here. Um, I'm making vegan sausage rolls and figoli. I don't know what figoli is, but sausage, vegan sausage rolls might do. I do like sausage rolls. And VetNet is here. Hi, Duncan and Ava Lynn and everyone from Michigan. Beautiful. And Emily, uh, gosh, it's so good to see all you people here. It's lovely to see you people here. Um, David Lehman says, uh, greetings, Reverend Ned from Alberta. Hello, David. Thank you for being here from Alberta. Um, Craftsman CTFL is here. Very good. And Steph from Sweden. Uh, hello to Duncan in Scotland from Steph in Sweden. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, let's see here. Good evening, Ed. Good evening, Ad. Thanks for being here. Stevie's Earth-Based Kitchen. I'm making vegan uh, green chili enchiladas. Oh, I like enchiladas. Okay, so we're already talking about food. Somebody on Wednesday said, we're always talking about food. We are literally eight minutes in and we are talking about food. <laughs> so I don't know if that's because we're all hungry or if that's because we're all full We've, uh, or if that's because we're dreaming about tomorrow. If you are in the ha Halifax, Nova Scotia area, I'm going to make a plug because we had I had Indian food tonight. We had Indian food after the basketball game because there's a brilliant Indian restaurant very close to the school my son was playing in. It's called the Red Chilies. It's, it's in Bedford, uh, which is a, a community part of Halifax, a neighborhood in Halifax, a little city in Halifax in the HRM. And it was so good. It is so good. So um, yeah, as many of you know, if you followed me for any length of time, Indian food has been my favorite for the last, for the last couple of years. I'm always, I would, I will always eat Indian food just straight up. I'll always eat it. And today we went to the little grocery store that's beside the restaurant. It's called the Red Chilies as well. And man, there's all kinds of like amazing, amazing um, grocery store items that they shipped over from India. And one of the things was this little biscuit. It was like, a, is it biscotti? That, that sort of uh, crispy, toasty kind of cake that, that's good with tea. Anyway, they had, oh, it was, okay. So that's my, that's my, listen, we're going to change, I'm going to change topics entirely right now. And I'm going to show you this picture. That's Dingo. That's my that's my dog. This is uh this is when Dingo and I went camping. This is when Dingo and I went camping uh, a couple of weeks ago, and this was him sitting under the table. He pretty much sat there for like three days. He didn't move a whole lot, mind you. I'm at the entrance of the of the camp when I'm taking this picture. So it's a very small camp. It's only I think on the inside it's about eleven by eleven. And, uh, and so there isn't a whole lot of room for, for Dingo or I to move around, but he did like it under the table. He does like his, he does like his caves. And, uh, this was him. This was about the most pleasant he looked in those days. That right there, folks, I don't know what breed of dog he is. Um, he was a rescue from Texas. I do not know what breed of dog he is, but I will tell you that right there is what a city dog looks like. He did not like the country. He did not like the woods. He did not like, um, at one time, I, I took him out to go to the bathroom and and I wanted to, I was working with him a little bit, excuse me, and he, uh, I just had him off leash. And with me, he's, he's pretty good off leash. And so we were walking and he, he peed, and as we kept walking, a branch dropped out of a tree, and he took off back to the cabin. He, was, he, he ran the fastest I've ever seen him run. When that branch fell out of that tree, you know how you're in the woods and you just hear things dropping? He, that's what happened. There was a tree sort of near us somewhat, and a, a, a must have been a dead limb or something fell out of the tree, 
and he took off like a rocket back to the cabin. I have never seen him move that fast. Uh, and he was right up on the door and he was waiting for me. And he looked back at me like, why aren't you running too? I want back into this cabin. Um, that right there, folks, again, I don't know what breed he is, but that is not a city dog. That is not a city dog at all. <laughs> so that's one of the, sorry, folks, that's just one of the ways that I, that I can take care of my beard when it starts to drive me nuts. Anyhow. Uh, Hani is here and Lori is here. Uh, Janine is here. Um, Cherry Ann, that's so cute. He didn't try to protect you or anything. No, he does not try to protect me or anything. Definitely not in his element. He is not in his element. Um, as a matter of fact, he, he does ne he never tries to, well, I mean, we haven't been in too many situations where he might need to, but, uh, he will, he will step up for the kids and he will step up uh, for my wife, but he will not step up for me. <laughs> I am not one of his priorities. <laughs> uh, yeah, poor Dingo Catherine. Yeah, is that right? Poor Dingo. <laughs> um, um, let's see. Badass Peacemaker. I like that name. Badass Peacemaker. Blessed will be the peacemakers. I love your messages. Thanks, Badass Peacemaker. And Derriere is here. Kelly is here from Texas. Well, that's where Dingo's from. Uh, he was found by, uh, I want to say it was a state trooper on the side of the road. And you know what? Next week, I'll see if I can't dig up that picture and, and show you. He's sitting in the back of the squad car and his ears are about the same size as they are right now, but the rest of his body is, is is significantly smaller. Uh, David Smith says, I also want to pray that something supernatural happens to stop Trump. I'm sorry I keep bringing it up, but I'm absolutely terrified. And sometimes the fear can be crippling. Yeah, I mean, we talked about that. Um, we talked about that in a video maybe a couple of weeks ago, that it is really, really easy for us to, um, to find ourselves uh, triggered and, and, and in an emotional state where we literally feel like we can't do anything, like we can't go anywhere, like like we're, we're we can't move, we can't think, we can't we can't act, we can't speak, we feel impotent um, in the moment, we feel uh, paralyzed, uh, we feel and and in that state, as if we maintain that that sort of state of being for any period of time, the next thing that kicks in is depression. So man, I I, I get you, David. Um, uh, personally, I I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, in 2016, I remember talking to my son um, up in Fredericton, and he was saying, "Oh, this is crazy." And 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 I remember the day Hillary Clinton was up by 16 points, and I remember then a couple of days, and and you know, I talked to my son about it, and I said, "Don't worry about it. Hillary's he's not getting in. Hillary's smoking him. He's she's she's destroying him." And then it was a couple of days later uh, was the election. When I went to bed, she had it wrapped up. When I woke up, holy... It was like, honest to God, I still think sometimes that everything that happened election 26... For, you know, November... What was it? 20, 2015, 2016. Excuse me, 2016. Then to today, I think sometimes it's just a big, huge dream. Because... Because... When I went to sleep, everything felt normal, and when I woke up, everything hasn't. You know, it's been a it's been a pretty wild ride. Um, politically speaking, it's been a pretty wild ride. So, what I would argue, what I would what I would challenge you, David, is is this: um, don't allow Trump's presence or his or his um, absence. have any kind of sway over your emotional health. And if, and this goes for everybody, if Trump, again, Trump's presence, Trump's absence, Trump's words, Trump's actions, Trump's status, uh, whatever it happens to be, we shouldn't let him have any control. Not that he wants control over my emotional status, but I, he deserves no control over my emotional status. As a matter of fact, nobody does. No person, no event deserves the right to, um, to inform 
my emotional state of being. And it's up to me to grow in such a way that I can that I can maintain that that um, that separation. I can maintain my identity. I can maintain my my uh, autonomy. I can maintain my my space. This because this is mine. And and honestly, my emotional state, my 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 mental state, the way I react to the world, the way I respond to the world, the way I feel about the way things are transpiring around me. Uh, that's all that I really own. Right, that's all that I really control, that I can really control. Uh, I'm not saying that I do control it. I'm saying it's it's all that I really can control. And and I want to work, and I would encourage everybody to work um, in such a way that we build up our emotional health. Work towards building up our emotional health in such a way that that anything outside, while it's important that we know about it. And while it's important that we're informed, while it's important that we are knowledgeable and that we may have an opinion about things, those things do not control us, right? Those things do not control us. That we, ultimately, we are the ones um, who, who decide how we're going to feel about whatever it is that's transpiring around us. Uh, so, David, God bless you. Um, I'll be praying. I, I, I'll, I'll be praying that I'll be praying that the voters show up. All voters show up. I'll be praying. Like, wouldn't it be cool if 100% of American eligible voters voters showed up at the polls? That's what I'm praying for. Um, yeah, yeah. But David, thank you for sharing that. Many people are going to feel. Many people, I think, could could. Um, Many people will, would be able to say, hey, you know what, that resounds, that, that's, that's kind of how I feel too. So thank you for being the one that says it. Uh, Everett says, a dingo ate my baby. Tracy Ullman was hilarious. Yeah, she's pretty good. Call him as I see him, says, hello, Reverend Ed and friends. Greetings from Cincinnati. Uh, nice and sunny here today. God bless this fantastic group. It brings a smile to my face. I love you all. Call him as I see him. I'm sure you hear this all the time, but I loved I absolutely loved and still do WKRP in Cincinnati. Still one of my favorite all-time shows. The original is one of my favorite shows. Uh, I can watch that. I can watch episodes of that today. And there's some cringeworthy moments. You know, looking back, there's some cringeworthy moments. But I can watch that show today and just laugh and laugh. And my favorite episode was the one where the state trooper came in. And he ran an experiment with uh, with Johnny and Venus uh, about their reflexes, and he was going to show on the on the radio that if you drink, your reflexes uh, slow down. And Venus got super slow, and Johnny got quicker <laughs> as it went on. And I know that's one of the cringy things, right? We that's, but it, oh my gosh, I laughed at that. Yeah. Anyhow. Um, Oscar says, I want a dog now, LOL. Well, it depends. If you're a city dog, get make sure you get a city dog. If you're a country dog, get a country dog. Um, Dana says, Dingo looks very distinguished there. Yeah, he does, right? Uh, SC says, I see where Dingo got his name, right? It's th those big ears on him. He's, yeah. Uh, Beth says, I loved being in India. I remember one church that I was at. I was served food on banana leaves. It was such an awesome experience. Hmm. That's really cool. All right. That is, that's really cool. Uh, Shirley says, hello, uh, Reverend Ed and all from Kalamazoo, Kalamazoo, Mississippi. Well, thanks for being here. Alwyn and Hammer says, eating is one of the most intimate things we can ever do. We're taking parts uh, of other living beings into us to become parts of ourselves. Hmm. Yeah. Um... Yancey says, Reverend Ed, may the Holy Spirit use you again. Hello, Church Without Walls. Louisiana weather is perfect for praising Jesus and Jesus' followers. That's awesome. Thank you, Yancey. Um, David Smith, again, says, I lose sleep every night thinking about this. I'm on disability and I get housing and I'm absolutely terrified of Donald Trump, even though it is eight months away. Please pray. 
Yeah, man, I, I get it. And, and, and so you've just added, you've just added more layers, right? You've just added more layers to your anxiety and God bless you, my friend. Um, if there's ever anything I can do, please feel free to shoot me an email. Uh, if you ever want to talk or something along those lines. Yeah. Kurt says, Reverend Edge, you said you would speak about penance. I did, Kirk. I did. And look, I'm going to show something here. Look, we're going to talk about penance. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. But I'm not going to talk about it right now. We're going to say hello to everybody or as many people as I possibly can first. Uh, so we're going to talk about penance. Tonight, we are going to talk about, we're going to talk about penance. And in particular, I was asked, what's my opinion of penance? So we're going to, we're going to open that up a little bit. It's actually... Oddly enough, a little more complicated than than I imagined when I first said, yeah, I'll talk about this on Saturday night. <laughs> because, of course, as I did a little bit of reading and I did a little bit of research and I, I wanted to open it up a little, I, you know, I want to make sure that I'm not just spitting my own personal opinions. Sure enough, it's actually a little bit more complicated than uh, than poor old Ed thought it might be. So maybe I should do the research before I respond to comments like that. <laughs> Uh, Everett says, I'm late. You can't be late to church without walls. That's right. You can't be late to church without walls. Green chili enchiladas. Amen. Uh, Chris says, hello, Reverend Ed, church without walls. Duncan, Ava Lynn, great to be with you from Las Vegas. Good to see you, Chris. Thanks for being here. And Monica says, I bake bread and ask our heavenly father to bless the bread to nourish body and soul. Well, it is baking right now and smells divine. Look forward to my first taste after church. That's awesome. And Beth is having burgers and homemade mac and cheese. Apparently, we're, we're doing the, the supper thing. Very good. Oh, Steve says, Figoli is Maltese, is a Maltese cake made for Easter. Shortbread with a, a marzipan filling. Ooh, that's interesting. You know, marzipan, it's strange. Marzipan is only available around here certain times of the year. And I'm not sure Easter is one of those times. I seem to remember I needed to pick it up. Um, a few years back, I went looking for it. I was making um, Simnel cake, which is a traditional, um, for those of you that are in England, well, this is just what my understanding, it's a traditional mothering Sunday uh, dessert. And it one of the ingredients is, is some marzipan. Couldn't find marzipan. They, they only have marzipan at Christmas, I was told. Yeah. Uh, eight mixes for our potluck. I'll be bringing garlic bread. Well, that's awesome. For what it's worth, if you're in the Halifax area, we're having a potluck here at the church tomorrow. It's something that we do on the... Uh, normally, it's the last Sunday of each month, but next Sunday is Easter, and with Easter comes family and, and, and travel. So um, we're doing it We're doing it this this Sunday instead, and it's just a community potluck where we invite everybody in, and, and it's been really great these last few months, though I haven't been able to make it because of, oh, wrong side, because of basketball, yeah. Uh, Rebecca says, also mindful that the people of Gaza are not descendants of Haman. Uh, Queen Esther took care of them a millennia ago. We need to pray for the folks in Gaza, don't we? Yeah, we need to vote. We need to pray for the folks in Gaza um, that they receive the their the needed supplies and they receive what they what they need to survive, um, and that we can we as a world and not just for the people of Gaza, but it'd be lovely if we could get to a place where no matter who they are and no matter what they've done, no matter where they've been, no matter what we, th where they, we think they've come from, that we just simply, regardless of their color or their language or their nation of origin, that we just see people, that we just see part of God's creation and that we respond to them and act towards them as we would respond and act towards God themselves standing in front of us, looking at us in the eyes. Yeah. 
Steph from Sweden, $130 for any of your ministries that can have a use for it. Oh man, Steph, thanks so much for that. Um, Trisha says we should pray for the people of Russia after the terrorist attack. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Julie, prayer request for the victims and the families of the Russia attack. Okay, so you guys are exactly on the same page at exactly the same time. That's really cool. Um, protection for Ukraine and for peace. Now that's interesting, right? That's that's a really it's it's that's an interesting thing, and I'm really grateful that that we're able to make that distinction, right? We want Ukraine protected. Well, Ukraine needs to be protected from Russia, and we're also praying for Russia, and we're praying for the people of Russia because they've also been they've also been attacked. Um, you know, when I was a kid, I don't know if I've ever told you this before, but when I was a kid, uh, I always liked the police and, uh, I always liked Sting. I just, I fell in love with Sting. I still, I still love that guy. He's amazing. And, um, they have a song, uh, I hope the Russians love their children too, I think is what it's called. And it's a song, really, uh, I think of empathy, or the song is a challenge for us to, to find our way to empathize. And, you know, it was written, I think, probably at the height of the Cold War. Uh, Reagan was doing his ever-loving best uh, saber-rattling, and, and, um, and the Russian premiers of the day were, were, were doing their best to respond, and and, you know, media was doing their best to make sure that we were all absolutely terrified of what the world might be and that we have to be afraid and that we have to stand up against this group or that group. And the police came out with this song talking about, it was, and it was talking about, it was talking about the world as it was in their day. And one of the lines was, I hope the Russians love their children too. I think that was, I think that was in the chorus. I hope the Russians love their children too, or something like that. And you go, wow, yeah, because they have, they have kids, right? They're people, they're humans. They, they have kids. They have lives. They have to eat. They have to feed their loved ones. They have to work. They have to buy their clothes. They have to put a roof over their heads. They have to learn how to read, how to write, how to do math. They like hockey. They like sports. They're people just like me, just like my family, just like my neighbors, just like my the, the other citizens of my country. They're not. The Russians aren't evil. The Russian people, the Soviets at the time, right? The Soviets at the time are, are not, they're not evil. They're just people. Now, it may very well be that leadership is awful and horrible and going to lead them in ways that are awful and horrible, but those people are just people. <sighs> God knows we are just people. Yeah. Uh, Marissa says, prayer requests, let's pray for the people of Russia affected by terrorism. You guys were all on the exact same page within seconds of each other. Good for you. Uh, Hermit, hey, Reverend Ed. Hey, everyone. Hey, Hermit. Thanks for being here. Um, Eight Mix says, do you have to be baptized to eat the cracker? Um, well, you don't have to be baptized to eat a Ritz or, um, you know, a saltine. I don't can't think of a cracker you get at the grocery stores that you have to be baptized for. But if you mean the wafer... Uh, or you know, there are there are some denominations that do actually use crackers. Um, in the Anglican Church, we use a wafer of bread, uh, a wafer of unleavened bread. It's actually really cool. It's it's really cool to see them make it. But anyway, um, do you have to be baptized to receive that? You have to want to receive it. That's what you have to be. Um, depending on on how strict the priest or the diocese, um, I have I have you know, from time to time been told that, yes, you have to be baptized before you can receive communion. And I've also 
I also know of situations where people were not baptized, and but they really, they really wanted to partake in communion. And how do you say no, right? At least in, in my denomination, how do you say no? Um, other denominations are strict and other denominations are, are very lax and, and very laissez-faire. But, you know, for me, what it comes down to is, are you coming up here because you want, uh, want the body and the blood of Christ to be a part of you? And if you want that, if you want that, who am I? Who am I to say no? Because I have no idea how this moment, this sacramental moment, will impact you and change you and and transform you, be a transformative. I have no idea who you'll be after this. Anyhow, that's a good question, 8 Mick. Thank you for asking it. That is a really good question. Um, Julia says, prayer request for Peter LaRue. Uh, if his bacterial infection is treated, he can have the brain surgery he needs after a severe fall on the ice. Oof. We'll be praying for him. We will be praying for him. Um, yeah. Alwyn and Hammer says, Reverend Ed Trevor is a friend of mine who is Catholic priest used to say, they have more right to ask for communion than I have to deny it. I stinking love that. I love that. Yeah. Uh, Walt now pig. We are all recovering children. Carl Jung. Mm. Yeah. I need to read more Jung. You know, I need to. I, you, you hear a quote from somebody and you're like, ah, oh, God, I really need to read more from that guy or that girl or that person. I. I mm. uh, Vicky says prayer request for Mike and I and our family. Amen. Vicky and Mike. And family and fur babies. Yeah. Uh, Vetnet says, my church is the ELCA, which is the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. If, is that right? Um, and anyone can have communion. Right. Uh, let's see. Josh says, in the Lutheran Church, uh, Missouri uh, Synod, you have to be confirmed as a member of into to receive communion that's not the case in all the elcas okay and seth says reverend ed when i come up here i want to have a beer with you and play a game of billiards uh i suck at billiards i'm okay at pool uh, but i'm awful at billiards that table is too big and those balls are too small um but what we could do is we could sit down and we could have a drink and we can have a coffee or a beer or whatever it happens to be and maybe some food and listen to some music and have a conversation that would be absolutely amazing yeah uh, and for, for what it's worth folks if you are out there and you're you ever come to Halifax I will be hurt if you don't drop me a uh, drop me a line all right you can call the church you can send me an email my emails in every every description of every video that I've ever done you'll find an email that is active and alive that I will get back to you on um, I'd love to hear from you. So if you're ever up this way, and so far I've had a guy who came up by train, I had a guy who came up by uh, a cruise ship, I had people that drove in from, from out west, I've had people that flew in from the southwest, uh, I've I, lots of people, uh, people that drove up from, from uh, uh, Massachusetts, uh, everywhere, right? I shouldn't say everywhere, but it would be really cool to see you. So if you're ever in the Halifax area, don't ever think, oh, well, he's probably too busy. I'm not. I will drop whatever it is that I'm doing if it can be dropped. And I will happily spend some time getting to know you and, and meeting you face to face. It'd be lovely. It'd be absolutely lovely. And, and, and if you ever want, you know, I've been thinking about this a lot lately. I don't know if there's ever like a speaking engagement, you think, hey, we could use a big hairy guy from Nova Scotia. A big hairy guy from Nova Scotia would be perfect for this. I know a guy and you want to give me a call. I will come down. That'd be really cool too. 
All right, that'd be really cool too. Um, let's see. Uh, Kathy says, Reverend Ed, I'd love to hear your thoughts on some of uh, on some time on near death experiences. I find them both fascinating and reassuring. Um, I agree. I agree. Um, I have no idea what's going on when it comes to a near death experience. I mean, if you re if you listen, depending on who you listen to, uh, people will put all their all their marbles and their opinions about what's transpiring when somebody has a near-death experience. My guess is that the truth is where those two things overlap and in there is, is where you find the divine. And for what it's worth, I think that's probably the case on most things. Um, I've never had a near-death experience. I've had, I've had several dreams that um, have turned out to be somewhat uh, prophetic. Uh, but I'm not a prophet, which is why I, I don't have a dream and then start typing about the dream that I just had, because as far as I can tell, the dreams that I have uh, that have been prophetic have never been for anybody else but me. Um, I've never felt any inclination that I was supposed to share them. Uh, I've had family members who've had, who've had encounters with, uh, with God and have have experienced reassurance um, and been offered hope and um, and comfort. Uh, I've never I've never challenged any. I'll, I'll tell you the only times I think that I've ever been in the situation where I would challenge someone claiming that God has somehow spoken to them, whether that's through a near death experience or a dream or or some sort of vision. The only time that's it, it's been when I've heard people speaking in tongues, and not every time. I, I've had many encounters where, um, many experiences where I've been in churches and somebody starts speaking in tongues, and you know that you know that it's it's real. Um, you can just you feel it. You just you feel it. Your the hair on your arm stands up. You you know, okay, what's happening right now is is real, and the message is also very. Um, is very timely and relevant. Um, and there's certain, you know, there's always a translator who's there who understands what this person is saying, despite the fact that nobody else does, including the person speaking. Uh, but I've also been at far, far more and, and far, far too many and far more than the real times I've been when, when people have just been faking it. And you can tell that too, because it means nothing. It's literally gibberish. There's no translator except for the person who's speaking, and that's not that's not cool. Anyhow, um, near death experiences. <sighs> yeah, my suspicion is, my suspicion is in that moment when that moment when our 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 bodies sort of have a, a momentary, um, they momentarily cease to, to function and our soul is released that there, there's probably many connectors between our soul and our body. You know, it's, it's something that we just don't understand. Um, and it's, it's kind of cool that we can, we can have those moments. We can bring back memories from, from that, those that period of time regardless of how how small that period of time may be uh amber says hi guys i'm here this week well good to see you thank you for being here um uh sea wolf blue says prayers for Teresa and perfect healing Teresa and her perfect healing from uh, her lifelong drug addiction. Absolutely. We'll be praying for her. Thank you, Seawolf Blue. Uh, (laughs) 
Terry Harris says, good rant. Thank you. I appreciate that. Ah, Sarah 2.0 says, the song is called Russians by Sting. Okay. <laughs> and Manatee says, the song is called Russians by Sting. I still have the words memorized because it was such a, a, a fear. Yeah. Uh, Stephanie, prayer request for cancer sufferers, especially Bill who has finished treatment and is doing pretty well. And for Larry, who is still undergoing treatment. So for Bill and Larry, and I'll add uh, Glenn to that, and all sufferers of cancer. Uh, a friend, my friend Glenn was just diagnosed with, uh, with throat and tongue cancer. Uh, and thankfully, they, they, they think they caught it very early. So we're, we're all grateful for that. Um, let's see. David says, Lord, please protect us from Donald Trump and his minions. In the holy name of Jesus, I pray that you would protect the safety net and our country as we try out, cry out to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. And you know, I'll, I'll tell you, who was I listening to? Oh, I can't remember who I was listening to, but the guy was going on quite a rant. And what he was saying is, you got to protect us from these, from these, from the powers that be. You know, open our eyes to to understand just how much they actually care for any of us. And by they, he he was talking about every politician everywhere. How many of them are actually working for our good? Um, my guess is the ones who are working for our good are not the ones that we actually ever hear about because they're too busy working for our good. But David, your prayer is, is heard, man. Uh, Jay Court, thank you very much for your generosity and for your kindness and for your charity. Call him as I see him. Thank you as well. However, uh, it can be used at your discretion. Uh, thank you for this ministry. It is just what I needed at just the right time. Call him as I see him. Thank you very much for your generosity. God bless you all. Folks, if you're wondering about these super chats, because I'm, I'm going to say this, we do have, a, we always have a few new people here and they see the super chats. And, oh yeah, here's another YouTuber. You know, another YouTube Christian getting money. Um, we use the funds that come in to um, to do ministry in our in our community. And when I say ministry in our community, I mean we use it to to feed people, to students, and we use it to um, uh, help buy lunches at the at, at the elementary school and supplies and um, clothing. Like you know, need we're in the this is the Atlantic Canada. It's cold here, so a lot of times winter. Um, winter uh, clothes. Uh, we use it for all kinds of different things. We're one of the things we're going to be working on in this in this coming spring. In June is we're going to have um, we're going to have an outdoor concert for anybody in the area, and um, just for our neighbors. We're going to have we're going to bring together a bunch of local musicians, and we're going to have a bunch of food, and we're going to have a bunch of other stuff, and we're going to, and that's because of, of your, your kindness and your generosity. Now, that's not the same as feeding people. I don't know. People will have a, well, you know, you shouldn't, you, you should spend it on, on, on food and you should spend it on clothing. Well, the truth is we actually know within our community that there's a lot of loneliness as well. And, and not just with kids and not just with young people, but we have a lot of seniors living in the area. We have a lot of families in our area who have no nearby connections. There's a, there's a, a large number of, of new immigrants to Canada who live within the, the, the blocks of the city that my parish takes care of, uh, who, you know, their families on the other side of the planet. And we want to make sure that we, we're going to try, we're going to try to offer something that, that everybody is able to come to, that everybody will enjoy. Um, last year we did it. We had a, a band from, a, a duo from I believe they're from Ontario come down. Maybe it was Quebec. I think Ontario, though, they came down. And um, we had uh, a group from the Valley come and play. And we had another duo, another local duo play. And our organist, who our organist Rebecca here at St. Margaret's, uh, she also does, uh, she's a brilliant musician. Just one of those people that she's so talented with everything she touches musically. 
and actually anything she touches, that it just kind of drives you a little bit nuts. You know those kind of people? Anyhow, Rebecca, um, she has a, uh, she does a music program for children. And so that day she put on a music program for children during this concert. And the kids and the families were, oh, it was amazing. I think we had, I forget the number, I was like 100 and some odd people showed up for it. And um, it just brought the community together. And so that's the kind of things, the super chats, all the views, all the revenue that comes in for the channel. Um, we, we pay tax on it <laughs> because, you know, churches should pay tax. So we pay tax on it and uh, we use it to, we use it to fund ministries within our community. And I'm very, very grateful for everything that you are uh, willing and, and so generous in helping us with. Uh, God bless you. I had a lady today. Uh, I think, it was, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's a lady. It's a comment. So a person. I had a person on YouTube today commenting on an old video that I did. And, you know, the first thing she said was, well, you should, you should stay out of American, American business. And I said, you know, no, thanks. I'm okay. But I appreciate your concern. And she said something along the lines of, you're only using Trump for clickbait. You're just, you're just, an, you're just making money off of his name. And, and I said, listen, I would gratefully, I would, I would be so grateful if I never did another video about Donald Trump. I only do videos about him when, when, uh, I only do videos about him when somebody, whether it's him or somebody around him, claims that he is somehow divinely placed, divinely positioned for this particular, for this particular role, for this particular job. But it did strike me that, you know, we do, we do generate revenue. We do generate revenue and not everybody knows that the funds that are received go towards what it goes towards. It doesn't go to me. Um, you can see I got to, I got to get a haircut at some point. My clippers have broken which explains a lot, I think. Um, explains a lot going on here right now, <laughs> follically speaking. Um, but yeah, we that money comes in and we, we do something. I think we do something really great with it. Um, and another thing that we've actually started doing is we've, um, uh, we've started using it to help fund um, a ukulele club where kids can come and learn how to play the ukulele for free. Uh, I'm, I'm very excited about a lot of the things that, that we do. Uh, and none of it, none of the funds that come in, by the way, uh, is used to try to get butts in the pews or for the maintenance of the building or to pay salaries. Okay. Uh, same as Patreon. So God bless you all. Thank you for all of your support. You are all incredibly wonderful. Uh, Linda, thank you very much. It says, let's celebrate their first super on a live stream. God bless you, Linda. Thank you so much for choosing Church Without Walls to be your your first um, your your first super on a live stream. Thank you so so much. Um, let's see. Kelly says prayer request for my sister and brother in law as they are facing a probable dementia diagnosis with my brother in law, Greg. Hmm. So we're gonna pray for Greg. And your sister. We'll be praying for them. Uh, my sister was my mom's primary caregiver, so this is really hard. Oh, I bet it will be. Yeah, I bet it will be. She's been through it once, and now she's going through it. She's going to be going through it with somebody, um, with her husband. Oh, my gosh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Um... Let's see. Aria says, prayer request, Tanya and her family, her, ch her child, Brandon, was bullied into taking his life. He went to Forest Hill School in Sidemen, Pennsylvania. I have permission to share. I'm devastated. Oh. So we are going to pray for Brandon. And we're going to pray for Tanya. And we're going to pray for Brandon's family. Classmates. And we're going to pray for those bullies. <sighs> Thank you.
Thank you, Arya, for sharing that with us. Uncle Fatty says, and I think I'm stepping into this a little bit late, but he's to clarify, the great flying spaghetti monster is welcome to all spiritual pirates, uh, is welcoming to all spiritual private pri pirates traveling along this supernatural plate of love. May the noodly appendage of a lifeline to all warriors of light. I, you know, it's strange. I, I've had I've had people come to me, you know, online or in person. Uh, over the course of my career, and they'll say, oh, you might as well just believe in the great flying spaghetti monster. Okay. If that works for you, okay. My dad, who um, is is someone of, of who I think is, I cherish him as someone of great wisdom and uh, and growth. Oh my gosh, I love how he grows. Anyhow, uh, he once told me, uh, he was talking about AA, Alcoholics Anonymous. And he said, in AA, one of the things you have to do is you have to give yourself over to a higher spirit. And I remember talking to him about this. And this wasn't terribly long ago. We've actually probably talked about it a few times. He said, uh, doesn't matter what that higher spirit is. Doesn't matter what that higher power is, excuse me. You have to give yourself over to a higher power. And it doesn't matter what that higher power is. If if it's God, it's God. If it's a, the great flying spaghetti monster, it's the great flying spaghetti monster. If it's the chair in the living room, if that chair in the living room is 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 an, an adequate representative of, of a of a greater spiritual power, then so be it. It's about surrendering, right? It's about it's about understanding that that you're not in control of the world around you. That there is something else happening. And again, is it the universe? Is it uh, you know? A flying man, uh, an invisible man on a flowing on a flying moped. I don't know. It doesn't matter. But you have to you have to give yourself over to a higher power. You have to because if you can give yourself over to a higher power, you're letting go of your desire to control the world around you to keep yourself. And and you know, if God, if you know God by the name, the great flying spaghetti monster, lovely. I would love to hear about your God. And if you know God as, as God, if you know God as Jesus, the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, the Father, great. Uh, if you know God as, as Vishnu, then that, great. If you know God as, you know, how many other names, I, 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 you know, I'm, 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 someday I'll learn more about other world religions. But the bottom line is, it doesn't matter what name you, you I don't think it matters what name you put on him. Um, let's see here. Prayer request from Sarah for Kate Middleton in residence of Moscow. Yeah. So if you haven't heard, um, Kate Middleton, the, what's she, the princess of Wales, um, was diagnosed with cancer. And that's why she's been out of the public eye for a little while. And, you know, I got to tell you, I get that she's a part of the royal family and that she has certain duties and she has certain responsibilities. But she went in for abdominal surgery, uh, I don't know, a month ago. And while she was in having the surgery, they, they apparently they didn't think it was cancerous. They discovered it was cancerous. And she, you know, she did an interview the other day and she said they were, she was just wrecked. She was so shocked by it. She was so shocked by it. And, and apparently her husband, William, he was devastated by it. And so they've been trying to process this news. And while they're processing this news, because she's been out of the public eye, uh, of course, the media is saying, oh, there's something going on. He's doing this. She's doing that. Blah, 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 blah. All these different conspiracies that are happening. There must, you know, all based around there must be something wrong, which there was, but all the conjecture. So here you are. Imagine being in that situation. Here, talk about empathy, right? Imagine being in that situation. You're, he, you've just received, um, you've just received a devastating diagnosis. I've never been, I've never been diagnosed with with cancer, or any kind of real ailment, high blood pressure, cholesterol, but that's about it. Many of you have been, so you know exactly what it was like for her 
to hear these words. Imagine trying to process that information while at the exact same time your nation is going, the media in your nation is going absolutely bonkers with increasingly wild stories about why you're not out in the public being seen. I feel bad for her. I really do. I feel bad for them. No air, no oxygen, no ability to take a breath in a moment where you really need to take a breath. God bless them. John says, hello from Nova Scotia. Hello, John in Nova Scotia. Good to see you. Thanks for being here, John. Um, let me see. Oh, Seth says, I think I should say this, but congrats. I think I should say this, but congrats to Rachel. Watching her become bishop was totally cool. So if you don't know, uh, yeah, I was going to, Bishop, Rachel Parker. So Rachel, Par Reverend Rachel Parker had, had a, has a YouTube channel where she talks about, well, talks about all kinds of different things. She's really, she's quite brilliant and quite pastoral. Um, well, she got, um, she got made a bishop. They made her a bishop and, uh, and she was consecrated. Uh, she was consecrated very recently. Uh, I didn't get a chance to, I didn't get a chance. I certainly wasn't there for the consecration, but I didn't get a chance to see it either. Uh, so Seth, thank you for reminding me of it. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, she's going to be wonderful. She's going to be, she's going to be a wonderful bishop. Yeah, she is definitely equipped for it. Um, and I hope, I hope her gifts and her skills uh, will find good use in her diocese. Yeah. Uh, prayer request. Please pray for, from Steph. Please pray for Bernton Solvig. They are not well just now, and I hope it's not COVID. They don't need that just now. Amen to that. We'll pray for Bernton Solvig, Steph, and we'll pray for Sarah, and we'll pray for Emmanuel, and we'll pray for Constantine, excuse me, in Uzbekistan. Uh, Oscar asks the question, what is penance? Okay, let's talk about penance. Uh, Vicky says, I haven't received anything from Bible study tomorrow. I'll send something off to you. Uh, give me, well, give me an hour or so after this service tonight, if depending on how late we get out of here, uh, but it'll be coming soon. Uh, penance. Okay, so I was recently asked this week if I would talk about penance. In particular, I was asked about my opinion um, what is your opinion? A friend of mine asked me of uh, what, tell us what your opinion of penance is. Okay. <clears throat> so my opinion of penance is my opinion of penance. All right. It's not gospel. It's my opinion of it. Penance has a couple of, there's, there's, there's a couple of different descriptions for it. So the, the, the first, and, and I think maybe the way I've always understood it was penance is, is the, the work, the actions you undertake, the, uh, uh, the way you pay, to use that to probably, that's probably not the right term, but the way you pay for the bad things that you do. How do you make up for it? How do you make amends for the bad things that you do? Those are, that's to me, that's always been my act of penance. So I've, I've never been Roman Catholic, but uh, you know, I've had friends who would go to confession and, and, you know, we'd be on our way to play hockey or play a board game or, you know, whatever. And they'd run in for confession because they had to make confession that day. Their parents told them to, and uh, they'd come out and say, oh, I got to do three Hail Marys and four Our Fathers. And that was their penance. And so that's kind of, I, okay, that's, that's penance. They went in, they, they made their confession, and in return for their confession, they were told what to do in order to, to make up for it. Now, it's important, we can't make up our, we can't make up for our sins. We can't make amends with God for our sins. We don't have to. So a penance was not 
I don't think it was ever about, okay, now God smiles at you because you said you're three Hail Marys and you're four Our Fathers, or because you worked at the food bank, or because you volunteered for 10 hours, or because you you tithed so much, or you, you offered so much to charity. I don't think, I don't think anybody, well, I, I certainly never saw that as, um, that, that penance was something that God needed us to do uh, in return for God's, in, in return for the restoration of relationship with God. Uh, in return for us to be loved again by God, and in, in return for there to be reconciliation between us and God. But rather, penance is what we do um, to remind ourselves that, that what we've done, we shouldn't have done. Um, I'm, not sh- I'm not certain that we've always gotten penance right in, in that we've asked people to do the right things, because really what we should be doing is... Um, you know, a good penance would be practicing walking in the other direction, practicing doing the things that you that you shouldn't do. Um, so, you know, you have uh, you've lied. Well, penance is telling the truth. Maybe your penance is going back to the person that you lied to and, and saying, "Hey, listen, I've lied to you about this, and this is what I need to. I, I, I need you to know this." Um, maybe penance is is forcing yourself, practicing, uh, always telling the truth, no matter what kind of trouble it's going to get you into. Um, and I know that's a, that's a whole other video about or should we lie, should we not lie, are there times where a lie is acceptable, so on and so forth. But let's just assume it isn't, okay? Just for the sake of this talk, follow me with this. Let's just assume that it isn't. Um, so that's kind of, that's generally my opinion my my opinion about what I think penance is. Penance is, is how we practice the work we do to practice the avoidance of the sins we've committed. Uh, the things we do, the actions we take, the words we say, whatever that whatever that work happens to be that helps us avoid making the same mistakes that we've made helps us missing helps us from missing the mark again those are those are good acts of penance those those that can be good acts of penance but um that's not the only definition of penance oddly enough like i said so there are there you know that's a that's i think what i've just described to you is is a, a common way of seeing it but penance is also also seen as just the act of confession itself uh, depending on your denomination uh, an act of penance is saying confession. And, and I can sort of see that, right? Un- unless confession, unless the, the, the moment of confession is something that's prescribed, that, that you have to do it. Okay, it's Tuesday. I got to go say my confession. But if, <clears throat> you know, it might, you know, saying confession might not be an act of penance. It's just something you have to do. Uh, offering confession, excuse me. But if confession isn't something that's prescribed, uh, isn't something that you have to do because it's the second Tuesday of each month, uh, that it's something that you do because of the of the pain you feel, because of the the contrition you feel, then I think a con- confession can be a real wonderful act of penance. Um, so yeah, um, again, when you ask me my opinion, that's that's pretty much it. That's pretty much my opinion on it. At the end of the day, we know that we all miss the mark and we're going to read part of a psalm here coming up. Uh, at the end of the day, we all, we know that we all, at the end of the day, we all know we miss the mark. Um, that none of us are perfect. That all of us uh, have opportunities to grow and to, and to be better, to do better. Um, Penance, I think, are the the wor- is is the work we do in order to grow, and in order to try to do better and to be better, and the work we do to help us avoid the pitfalls of missing the mark in the ways that we've missed the mark. Yeah, I don't. Know, what do you think? What do you folks think? What, tell me about, tell me what you think about about penance and and what your opinion is there. Amen. All right. 
Ignit Nets. Ignit Ignits Ness. Hello. Hello. Um Oh, sister is Kathy. Very good. Uh, Ann P. Leon says WK therapy was good. The Thanksgiving episode was hilarious. Yeah, the Thanksgiving episode was was absolutely hilarious. I thought turkeys could fly. Owen and Hammer says, yeah. Yeah, as God ever, it says, as God is my witness, I thought turkeys could fly. Um, Uncle Fatty says, prayer for all those going through divorce breakup, and especially those dealing with addictions. Yeah. Um, just looking for prayer requests. Kathy McGuire, prayer request. I think it's time for us to pray for Trump and Magna. I don't know that they seek to love more, shine more light. I don't know. You choose, Rev. Let's pray for them. Let's pray for that group. Let's pray for everyone running for elected office. Let's pray for the people in elected office. I think that's, I think Kathy, that opens up a whole wonderful box of, of people we should be praying for, right? Uh, Everett says, I'm going to brag. My wife and daughters are getting sushi to bring home. It's awesome. Um, let's see here. I'm just looking for prayer request. Oscar, prayer request, prayer of Thanksgiving. The anxiety is pretty much gone. Thanks for prayer. Thanks to the prayers of this group and Reverend Ed Trevor's, uh, prayer works. I'm the proof. Amen. Let's see. Do, do, do. Um, okay, so Cherry Ann says, when the right started covering the insurrection like it was some minor disturbance, despite what my own eyes saw, I, I started uh, preparing for the worst. You know what? I, I think... I think the day will come. I was thinking about this the other day. So Cherry Ann mentions uh, mentions January sixth. You know the the resurrection, the resurrection. Excuse me, the insurrection um, at the Capitol. And I remember, I remember watching it because that was the very first time I ever did a live event. I saw it and I went, hmm. I wonder if people want to talk. And so we, I clicked. I had no idea. I still don't know what I'm doing, but you know, started the YouTube live. Um, I think the day is going to come when the response from the right, we'll just say, from from Republicans, and, and not just the fact that I think the day will come when the response to the res, to the insurrection by Republicans in the United States, how they responded to the insurrection, the day is going to come when that's going to be studied. And it's not just going to be studied because they're going to say, okay, well, these 15 people, um, they think it was an act of terrorism. And, and these 200 people, they think it was just visitors to the, to the Capitol. And these people think that it was, um, it was Antifa. And these people think it was the FBI. And these people think it was leftist plants. And these people think it was, um, uh, you know, uh, in an, uh, uh, 
just a, a group of CIA agents or, or whatever the case might be, that it was an inside job and these people think this and these people think that and these people think... The day is going to come when that's all going to be studied. Because those who seem to say this is an insurrection and this is unacceptable and this was an act of, of domestic terrorism, they seem to hold to that. For the most part. There have been a couple of flip-floppers. Ted Cruz, you know, an act of terrorism to no just a couple guys looking for a good hot dog right like that's the flip-flop um i but they'll study it because a lot of these people who have a view have many 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 different ways of seeing it or they at least express many 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 different opinions about what actually happened that day it's it's you know you, you can you, some of them will say what well, was antifa it was, it was the Antifa terrorist organization. They did this and they got this going. And then in the very next breath, that person looking at a different camera will say, these were just good old boys taking a, a tourist trip through the Capitol building. They were just here to, to, to see what was going on. They weren't doing nothing wrong. They were just here exercising there. So they, they are literally holding two completely separate to what, what should be two completely disjointed opinions. And they're not. They are somehow, they are somehow walking with this contradiction. They're somehow living with this, with these contradictory understandings about what transpired that day. And I, I think that's fascinating. I, I really do. What does it take for a person to get to the place where in one hand they will say, this was a horrible act committed by the left. And in minutes say, this wasn't a horrible act. This was just people looking to find out what the building looks like. Uh, find out where the, you know, to, to take a look around and what, where Congress works. To be a part of the, to be a part of the, uh, the electoral college count and the certification of the vote that's all this was so on one hand they literally this was an act of violence committed by the left and immediately looking at a different camera for a different network saying there was no violence these were just people looking for a hot dog to me i find that i found that i find that utterly fascinating and uh again i i think i think at some point somebody's going to do a really in-depth search, uh, in, in, do some really in-depth research into that. <clears throat> At least I hope so. I'd, I'd read that book. I would be really interested in reading that book. <sighs> Kathy says, Reverend Ed, I'm equally fascinated by the mega brain. Yeah. Uh, Midnight Man says, the videos of January 6th will be the history of for future generations. That's right. That's right. And at some point, those future generations, they'll, they won't hear the rhetoric. They'll just look at the pictures. They'll just look at the images. And you can look at those images and, and oof, okay, this well, they weren't looking for a good hot dog and they weren't looking for a soda. They were angry. These people were angry about something. Oh, I, I, cause you know, generally tourists don't put things through windows the way they were putting things through windows. Generally, they don't crush police officers in turnstiles like that. Yeah. Um, Monsoon says those history classes will be wild. You know, there's a, a horrible picture that I, that I, I, I remember seeing years and years and years ago, but it's, 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 it's never really gone away. And it's a picture of, of a little girl, uh, an African-American girl walking to school. And she's walking into this school as one of the first African-American students after the school was de uh, uh, desegregated. That she was, she was, by law, she was entitled to attend this school. And she, escorted by, I'm assuming, some form of police officer. I, I don't know who they were. But she's walking into this school. And I know you've probably all seen this picture as well. It's a powerful picture because this kid looks fearless. Like she does. She looks <laughs> like, anyway, 
Right, Ruby Bridges. She is still alive. That's her, the image. Her image isn't isn't the horrific part of this picture. The horrific part of this picture is in the background, and you see these. Uh, I think it's a woman. I think it's a series of women, but there's lots of people, and they are screaming. They are screaming, and they are. You can only so. I'm assuming they're screaming because it's a still picture. It's a excuse me. It's a still picture. It's a black and white picture, and you just see them. They're okay that image says a million words right oh those white folks behind her they aren't happy they're not happy at all and if you know the context of the situation you go oh and that's why because something was changing something was changing and they didn't want it changed they were really really upset by this they were really angered they were in a state of rage those women in the background, those people in the background who are raging at Ruby Bridges, that image is frozen in time. That happened. There's no getting around it. There's no saying, oh, no, you know, desegregation was an easy thing that we all just did. We all just got over it. No, you didn't. You were really angry. You were really, really, really wild. You were enraged. The picture tells me all about what was transpiring around Ruby Bridges that day. The picture tells me in 2024 a great deal about the state of Ruby Bridges community at that time. The videos from January 6th for a generation that is removed right and removed and by that i mean uh, for the for the for that first generation that that wasn't around for the january 6th insurrection who will only see it as a moment in time when they watch those videos those videos will tell them will tell them everything they they need to know those, those videos will be incredibly informative to them. And there'll, there'll be no, oh, uh, no, no, they were just looking for a hot dog. There'll be no, oh, no, 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 they were, they were, just, they were just there to be part of the electoral college uh, vote certification. No, they won't be fooled. That, gener that, that generation who will see these, pic these images in 20 years, they won't be fooled. They will not be fooled by... by uh, politicians or pundits or news people they'll know exactly what it is they see yeah uh maggie 103 says prayer request for my sister annette she was hit by a car oh praying for her recovery yes We'll be praying for her. Uh, L'Oreal says, I've seen it said that the guys trying to ban books like Ruby Bridges uh, don't want their grandchildren seeing how they acted. Yeah. I could, I could, I, I get that. Right? I get that. Isn't there a, isn't there an image of, is it Jerry Jones? Some, like, some, big name in professional sports but there's an image of them um a picture of them at one of those in one of those moments where they're on the side of desegregation that they're upset that the school has been desegregated and i can't remember i can't remember who it was i i, I want to say it was jerry jones isn't he's the owner of the dallas cowboys i think maybe jerry west i don't know anyway um yeah Let's see. T. Flower says, the John Kennedy in Congress right now is a perfect example of that attitude and behavior. Hmm. Book ban should be illegal. You know, we say that. 
we say that. I, I'm always I'm always really curious about that. Book bans should be illegal. Whenever somebody will write a book that I wanna that I wanna ban, right? They'll say a book filled with hate. I'm like, Ugh, anyway. Uh, you know what, Deb? Rationally, you're absolutely right. Intellectually, you're absolutely right. Um, emotionally, I, I'm gonna be I'll be a hypocrite someday and say that book should never have been allowed out. Right? But you're right. But you are right. Book bans should be illegal. Yeah. I heard that, Marissa. Marissa says, Ruby said that she was so young and innocent that she thought they were there to welcome her to the school and were very happy. God bless children. Amen. Right? I, I remember hearing that. She, she didn't actually know they were there to keep her out. Yeah. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. Nate says she was escorted by the National Guard. Okay. Cherry Ann says her book was banned in a few states in the South. Can you imagine? Kathy, thank you very much for your generosity. Thank you very much for your charity. God bless you. Um, let's see let's see let's see i'm just looking for some prayer requests right quick fast and in a hurry here folks pardon me uh great knitting prayer request for my 84 year old sister who has been failing and in falling excuse me and injuring herself but will not accept help she lives alone and is mentally sharp my family and i are frustrated so we'll pray for great knitting Sister. It's tough. Um, it's, it's a very common thing that we see. People, people have lived in a house their whole lives. My husband built this house. My wife and I built this house together. Um, nothing's changed in this house since 1952. And I'm never going to leave. Um, we see it. I, I, I bump into it all the time. Um, and God, God bless those people, right? They're, they're so emotionally invested in, in, this, in this space. It matters. And, and it can be really frustrating because all we want is their health and, and they don't see. All we want is for them to be healthy and to live a healthy life. And in fairness, they, they do not believe that they will have a life outside of this of this place there is no life away from this home this is my life this home is my life this is where i've lived my whole life leaving will be the end of me you know we're amazing we are amazing creatures hum humans are amazing creatures and our our emotions and our emotional energy is so ridiculously powerful our emotional energy is so ridiculously powerful it connects us to things and it connects us to one another <clears throat> or disconnects us right separates us so god bless you great knitting and your family and and in your frustration and uh, we'll be praying for for you all and for especially for your sister yeah um let's see david says wanted to ask your opinion of god, god does god sometimes have extra protection over the handicap because some things are just too much for them to handle Hmm. My sense is that God, uh, if I could use this term, God has a special place in God's heart for those who are on the outside, those who are on the margins. 
and people with disabilities, despite the fact that we, you know, we have, we've, we've made just in my lifetime, great leaps and strides uh, of inclusivity. Uh, and, and some of the stigmas have, have gone away. Not all of them, some of them. Um, my sense is that God does have a special place in God's heart for the disabled and, and for those who struggle and for those who are alone and for those who, who find themselves ostracized and for those who find themselves excluded. Uh, whether that exclusion is something that has been cast upon them maliciously or cast upon them just out of ignorance. Um, my, my sense is that God does have a special place in God's heart for, for the disabled, for the handicapped, for, again, for those who are, for those who find themselves, for whatever reason, excluded from the community they live in or from aspects of the community they live in. Um, I remember years ago doing a, my, I think it was like one of my first papers, actually. I had to, it's interesting, we've been talking about baptism tonight. I had to do a paper about baptism. And I chose to do it about godparents. And one of the, one of the things that I read was um, a paper written by um, Memno Simons, I think was the guy's name. And he was, uh, uh, he was a European. I want to say he was, I want to say he was from the Netherlands. And, uh, and he was writing about baptism. And he actually went so far. So this is like the 15, 1600s, maybe 1700s. He was a contemporary of, of, of Luther. And he was a contemporary of, uh, Calvin sort of lesser known, but he was one of their contemporaries. Anyway, he was writing about baptism and, and he actually said that uh, disabled children shouldn't be baptized. Right. Uh, which leads me to another point. I also think God has a special place in God's heart, probably even, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm projecting onto God, obviously. I'm projecting onto God my own feelings. But I think God has a special place in God's heart for those the church has turned away from. Whether that, whether that means protection, you know, a special extra protection, I struggle with that concept just as it is. Does God protect us? Um, because I think theologically speaking, what do you mean by protection? Like the question for me is, okay, well, what do you mean? How, when you say protection, what do you mean by protection? Explain that to me. You know, try to give me some details here. Do you think, do I think God protects us? What, what does that even, what does that even mean? Because sometimes I can't quite, sometimes I can't quite wrap my head around uh, how humans believe God is, is protecting them. Um, is God with them? I'd happily answer that question and say, absolutely. Is God with the disabled? Is God with the challenged? Is God with the handicapped? Is God with the ostracized? Is God with those on the outside? Is God with those on the margins? Is God with those whom the church has turned away from? Is God with, with those who find themselves alone, who find themselves um, excluded? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. All the time. All the time. David, thank you for the question. I'm not sure if I answered it properly. I'm not sure if I answered it in the way you want. Uh, it's, it's a big question. It's a deep question. There's many, many, many levels to that question, and I'm, I'm very grateful for it. Amen. Um, 
Seth says, Reverend Ed, I had an interesting interaction with my sister. I called her on Monday and she didn't recognize my voice until I told her it was me. We had a very fun conversation for two hours. God bless you. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Um... Let's see, let's see, let's see. Huckleberry Shoal, Huckleberry Shoal, uh, pie for Steve. Penance is an act of returning balance to the world around you. That's, that's deep. That's, isn't it strange how just in a few words you can wreck a person's brain? Thank you, Huckleberry. Thank you for wrecking my brain for a little bit tonight. Yeah, that's pretty deep. Um, Stephanie says, how do we differentiate penance from atonement? Great question. <laughs> um, great question. That's actually one of the things that, one of the things that I read today was was talking about the of how our understanding of penance and repentance and atonement and um, uh, there was something else, how they all overlap and that they're all sometimes used interchangeably, despite the fact that they all actually do mean different things. We've sort of pushed them all together to mean, to mean something, in a, you know, to mean something similar. Uh, we're, we're, we're saying the same thing using different words. Um, so that's, that's a great question. Uh, and I, I don't have an answer for you. I, I apologize. I don't have an answer for you. Uh, but I, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll take a look at atonement and I'll do a little reading on atonement this week. Yeah. Um, prayer request from Steph, uh, from, for Cheryl Alt and Wolfgang. Are they here yet? I haven't seen them. They often don't show up until a little bit later. Uh, for Justin and his family, we'll be praying for them. Absolutely. Paul is here. Sorry, Reverend, but I feel confession is something that helps us feel good post sin. I feel that our sins should stay with us so that we never forget the sin. Okay. But that's not confession, right? So just because, well, you know what? For some people, maybe it is. For some people, they, they confess. Somebody waves some hands at them. Go pray this and this and this. And they, okay. And I, know, uh, I don't operate that way. If I do something I shouldn't do, then then if I do something that I shouldn't do, I know it, I feel it, I carry it. Um, confession, from, from a biblical standpoint, if you look at Paul, when he talks about it's good to have a confessor, confession wasn't about, I'm laying all my sins at your feet, and now I can go home, you know, bright and breezy. Confession was about inviting somebody else into your journey. And you saying, hey, listen, this is something I'm struggling with. This is something that I find myself doing. And, and I don't know if it's good or bad or, or whatever, but I know that it, it's not something that's feeding me. Um, I know that this isn't something that I should be partaking in. And I want you, by inviting you in as my confessor, I want you to walk this journey with me. I want you to help me. Uh, I, I want you to, to be someone that I, that I have to be accountable to. Um, some of us need accountability. Some of us need somebody to be accountable to. Some of us don't. Um, but again, the, the understanding in the New Testament about having a confessor was, was about inviting somebody to walk beside you. It was like having a counselor having somebody there to support you, having somebody there to take care of you, having somebody there to listen to you, having somebody there to, to challenge you and say, hey, wait a second, you told me that this was going on. You told me how this felt and you're still doing it. Do you not remember that it, what you told me? Do you not remember how it's harming you? Let me remind you of your words, right? So, um, yeah, Paul, it's uh, confession, isn't isn't about waving a magic wand. It's not a, it's not a whiteboard, right? You don't when you go to confession, you're not taking a big cloth to your whiteboard of sin and and making it all clean. It's it's different than that. Going going to confession was was about like I said, it was about about asking for help and about somebody saying, "Yes, I'll walk with you." 
Um, Sarah says, I haven't mentioned this here, but I'm currently reading the Bible just as a book. Incredibly, I haven't never done that. It's a good book. It's a good book. You know, I know people who have no faith. What, like when I say no faith, I mean, they, they don't, they don't have a Christian faith. Okay. They don't have a religious faith. They don't have any religious practices. They would find that actually quite abhorrent that they, they want nothing to do with the church. They, they, they really don't believe in God and they love that book because it's, it's filled with, it's filled with wisdoms and it's filled with, with story that, uh, that are, that are, that offer guidance. And, and maybe I think they're able to get so much out of it because they aren't coming at it from a place where they have a faith and the faith demands that the book tells them something or not, that they're able just to read it and then parse the story and take what they can from the story from where they are. It's a great book. There are many books like that. Um, there's a book that I was introduced here, that, that I was introduced to from, from this from this community called The Prophet. Um, and I've read that book. I bet you I've read that book seven times in the last two years. Every, you know, for a long time, it was every morning I would read a different, I would read a chapter. I haven't read it probably in six months, but I'm going to get back to it. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know what? Next week on Monday, tomorrow, I'm going to wake up and I'm going to read the first chapter of The Prophet because it speaks to me. It shares with me. It, it really offers me something. It's not biblical, but the story is powerful. The stories, I should say, this is many stories, but the stories are powerful. Uh, Kurt says, penance used to be a way of spending less time in purgatory. That's right. Yeah. Um, well, we talked about purgatory a little bit, right? And, and you're right. It was, penance was, you do your penance, you don't have to spend it in purgatory. Um, anyhow, but again, that, that see, depend, it's depend, it's all depends on your perspective, right? Perspective is everything. Perspective, perspective, perspective. It's, um, how are you coming at this? How are you seeing this? What are the benefits of this kind of thing? So Kurt, you, you make good points. Um, I, I don't believe in purgatory. I think that if if Jesus died for my sins and that if I've chosen to follow Jesus, um, then there can't purgatory is is an anathema. It's just it's not something that should exist. it's it's foolish. Uh, and for those of you that are that that believe in it, I apologize, but that's just where I'm coming from. Jesus' sacrifice was adequate to cover the sins of the whole world more than sufficient. The idea that there'd be this holding pattern that I have to take flying over the airport of heaven, just, it strikes me as odd, you know. Um, let's, uh, <laughs> and also what Ed said, um, Reba Ann Buckner says, Reverend Ed, my parents have both been dead several years. They are with, are they with our Savior or are they in the graves awaiting the return of the Savior? So, yeah, that is what's known in the church as an eschatological question. Uh, end times. Um, personally, uh, I... I don't believe in linear time. So I do believe that your parents are with God. They're with God. They are at God's feet. They are basking in God's warmth. They are in the presence of the most holy. They are experiencing a joy beyond anything I could ever know here. They are experiencing a peace that I can only dream of. And even my dreams would be inadequate to describe the peace that they're feeling. They're 
They are experiencing a connectivity to the universe, to the world, to the people, to us. That is beyond comprehension. Their graves may contain their bodies, but no grave can keep their spirit. And uh, that's kind of where I come. Yeah, that's what I think. That's what I think. Thank you for the question. Eight Mix says, I want some positive vibes. My son will be, my mom will be in my son's and my life this week. She wants to take my son for a couple of days. Please, may she stay sane, safe, and sober this week and not piss me off. Ah, <laughs> uh, Eight Mick, God bless you. We'll pray for you. We'll pray for you. We will definitely send some good vibes this week, this to you this week. Uh, Paul, penance is knowing that you have sinned. It's the crappy feeling that you get and never forget, uh, and never forget the sin. Since you know it was bad, you'll never do it again. The other side of that, though, is in you know, is we get used to the sins we commit. If we commit them enough, they just become habit. They become part of us we don't see them as sin anymore. We just, you know, they still, they don't, you know, they hamper our lives. They, 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 they become a barrier boundaries for it. They, they set up boundaries for us, become a barrier for us for growth. Um, but they, be, they become so, so much a part of us that, that we're not certain we can ever be rid of them. Hmm. That's interesting. That's interesting. Uh, Gloria, thank you very much for your generosity. Thank you for another wonderful Saturday evening. Thanks for being here, Gloria. And thank you, Stephanie, for your generosity. It says here, let's celebrate their first super on a live stream. So congratulations, Stephanie, for your first super on a live stream. Thank you very much. Uh, Marta Brennan says, prayer request, prayers for my brother, CJ, who is in a nursing home on the West Coast. We'll be praying for him. We'll be praying for CJ. Um, let's see here if I find some uh, other prayer requests. Uh, Ray says, hello, Rev. Uh, hello, Ed. I got to ask, what is the sign saying is still broken? The sign is making my wife D nuts. Uh, so that sign back there, it says still broken. It's pointing to the clock because the clock is still wrong. Because when we were doing this last year, a uh, year before, every week somebody would say, hey man, your clock's wrong. Your clock's broken. Your clock's broken. And in order to save myself the public shame and the scorn, I would put new batteries in it. Every week I'd put new batteries in that thing. And it would never ever stay it would never ever be right um but i remember taking it down one week and having somebody say oh no you took the clock down so clock is up sign still broken so that nobody's nobody misunderstands that that wall where the clock is is um an exterior it's close to an exterior wall and because it's close to an exterior wall and these walls are stone the the cold drains the batteries apparently that's what i've been told um so as long as that clock is there, it's never going to be right. But when I move it, people want to know where the clock went. <laughs> so you get, you, you feel me, right? You get where I'm coming from here? You get where I'm coming from? Um, Mary Poza says, so I haven't heard, is the Princess of Wales cancer fatal? Not that I'm aware of, not that they're saying. My understanding is that they caught it early. Yeah, But she she is undergoing... What did they say? She's undergoing, she's going to be undergoing precautionary chemotherapy treatments. Uh, Uncle Fatty says, prayers for all survivors of abuse. Uh, 
Prayers for all survivors of abuse. Absolutely. Prayer request from Anne P. Leon. For all parents who have lost children, especially Mike, Rebecca, and Church Without Walls members, uh, pray also for the siblings and relatives, protect, particularly the little ones who don't understand. So we're going to pray. Hmm. We'll be praying in. Thank you. Um, Uncle Fatty says, Fellowship is why I love the Church Without Walls uh, congregation. Amen to that. You know what I love? I love the fact that Church Without Walls, it took. That that it's something that people will all, all hear about it. I think it's amazing. And that's what we call it instead of, you know. Um... Prayer request for the family and friends of Riley Strain, the missing college student who was found uh, dead in Nashville. We'll pray. Um, Nan says, prayer, please add my 50-year-old nephew with stage 4 pancreatic cancer and my nephew by marriage, 53, uh, fighting stage 4 lung cancer. Whew. We'll be praying for them. We'll be praying for them. Everett says, I'm sorry I have to go, but we'll watch if you post this. Everyone be well, and may you live in interesting times. Oh, we live in interesting times. <laughs> Maybe could we live in just a little bit more mundane times? That would be okay, too. Uh, Julie says, as a citizen of the USA, I'm grateful for you for speaking power to truth. Uh, truth to power, excuse me, Reverend Ed. Thank you. Um, Vicki says, Reverend Ed, you're in our prayers. I worry that you overextend yourself. Well, I appreciate that. I love what I do. I, I really do. I, I, I really do. And I may be overextending myself. We'll see. <laughs> we'll figure it out. <laughs> uh, uh, Emily says, here in West Hartford, we are lucky enough to have a Jewish crown market. Ooh, very good. Leslie, thank you very much for your generosity, if I haven't thanked you already. Uh, captain says, whoops, looks like I'm late. Anybody want to fill the captain in? Oh, and Cheryl Alt just made it. Good evening to my good people. Hope all is well with you. Life has been complicated in Vienna lately, uh, but we're hanging in there. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Good to see you. Cherry Ann says, prayer request from Lynn Sweeney. She and her husband are on a journey to new home. And good use could use some prayers. So we'll pray for and her husband. Thank you, Cherry Ann. Thank you for the for the heads up. Uh, Cypher says, if you have a fast computer system that randomly generates time down to a second, you could get it to accurately tick uh, a right time once on average. Okay. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. We are body and, and spirit, Paul says. Amen to that. Maybe Mick, maybe paint a clock on the wall. Okay. Omar says, Purgatory is a movie I watched once, and if I remember, was so bad I never wanted to watch it again. There's a couple of movies out there like that. Uh, Catherine says, is about our faith. It's our, it's, it's, uh, its own. 
being insufficient. His grace is always enough. Amen to that. Yeah, Marissa says, Reverend Ed, you can't make us all happy. I love your clock and look forward to the wis- and to its wisdom every week. <laughs> I, you know, a broken clock does offer a certain amount of wisdom, I suspect, right? Um, Cypher says, according to Gnostic Christian teachings, the Christian nationalist movement in the U.S. is, is uh, the Pharisee movement. <sighs> Yeah, um, I don't even think you have to go to the Gnostics for that. Uh, the Pharisees, as depicted in the Gospels, uh, were, you know, they were the they were the antagonists for Jesus, which is odd given the fact that the Romans were also present. the The antagonists were the religious, uh, the religious elite, the religious leaders, um, those who who of professed faith and authority. Um, desired that everybody live their way. Now, over my years, and, and on, again, I'll say it because of my contact with many of you, you, you realize that well, the Pharisees as depicted in the Gospels weren't all like that. Um, and yet the Gospels did use, in, in often cases, especially in, in probably the Gospel of John, uh, very generalized language. Uh, to describe a small group of people, they use a generalized language that that today we read it and go, oh, it means all of them, but it doesn't. Um, so yeah, uh, I, that's that's probably a really good way of seeing it. That's I, I, that's I think that's again. I, I don't know what the Gnostic Gospels would really say. I, I have, I'm not a, a huge student of them, um, but even our Gospels, just the, the the canonical Gospels, tell us that that um, it's it's not cool. It's not cool to try to. Uh, force others to live the way we think they should they should live uh, it, Catherine says purgatory is the stage of existence where we finally let go of our attachments to habitual sin and separations from God due to our own choices it isn't about Christ's sacrifice being sufficient it and I saw that it is about our faith on its own being insufficient. His grace is always enough. So if I could put words in Catherine's mouth, what she's saying is that purgatory is, is something we experience here, a, a spiritual, emotional state we experience here. That's really fascinating. That is worth thinking about. Omar says, get a solar clock. The sun's over there. This back play, this well, I, oh, I suit me like a photovoltaic. Hmm. But then I wouldn't have that clock. Just let me have my sign. All right. <laughs> just, just, <laughs> um, Hermit says, right. So Hermit gets it. I'd send you a new clock, but it might ruin the whole thing. It's, it's, it's one of the things I think that Church Without Walls is known for. Like in a in hundred years, people will be like, oh, the church, the church without walls and our broken clock. You know, as, as our churches start springing up all over the place, they'll all have a cross and they'll all have a broken clock on the wall on, the, on one particular side. That doesn't work. Ray says, we're buying you a new clock. No. <laughs> oh, Tiani, Reverend doesn't need, uh, doesn't fix clock, needs a subplot to the show. Love it. Don't move it. We need something to troll him with. And I'm, I'm willing to be trolled on that for sure. Uh, you know how many, like, it's odd. Of all the things we've been talking tonight, there's a lot of energy around this broken clock. Um, and you're right. Seth says, Reverend, the, the broken clock is right twice a day. Amen. Beth says, prayer request for my friend Ruben, who's going to start chemo th- soon. We'll be praying for him. We will be praying for him. Allison, please pray that I can learn to knit easily. Uh, I want to be able to teach patterns in my libraries. So Allison, uh, I'm going to offer a little unsolicited advice. Knitting is hard. <laughs> my mom and my grandmother both tried to teach me how to knit when I was a kid. And I, I think I, I knit a scarf that was about that wide and about that long. Uh, knitting is hard. And it, it does take a little while. But you can do it. And I, I think it would be amazing if you did. 
Uh, but I, my guess would be in your community, there's a bunch of seniors who know how to knit and would love the opportunity to pass that knowledge on. Um, it's something that I, uh, I was actually, I, I was reminded of a ministry in a town called Yarmouth the other day. Uh, and in Yarmouth, um, they started a program where they had some seniors in their community who were teaching anybody who wanted to come things like sewing and knitting and crocheting uh, and, uh, uh, you know, like sewing on a machine and stuff like that. So um, I would, in, you know, they had amazing success with it while it, while it lasted. It was a, it was a great ministry for like four or five years. Um, but we will be, we'll be praying, we'll be praying for you, Allison, and for your knitting skills. So for Allison's knitting skills. For Allison's knitting skills. That's a that's a new one for us, I think. Let's see. B says, I held my breath waiting for that answer, Reverend Ed. I so envision my son in God's presence. B, your son is absolutely in God's presence. Yeah. T Flower says, atheist adjacent, first time I've heard that description. Yeah, it's a good description. Well, Lori says, I just saw, got a flash of that Star Trek Deep Space Nine episode. Uh, where a scene where Cisco meets the wormhole aliens and they're discussing linear time. I don't know if I'm familiar with that. I maybe I w did watch some Deep Space Nine uh, when I was younger. I didn't get it uh, a whole lot. So anyway, uh, maybe that's where I got this from. Tiani says, reading the Bible from cover to cover also allows us to understand where people are coming from and how people choose to relate to others today. It's an eye opener. Read it, read it several times. It's scary. It's scary. It's, yeah, it's all kinds of things. Let's, um, uh, Cypher. Oh, this is where it must become from. Cypher says, I'm an atheist adjacent follower of Christ learning from books, not included in the Bible. I just want to thank you for staying awake to the values of Christ and not promoting the boot. All I got is Christ, man. All I got is Christ. Huckleberry says, uh, Reverend Ed, I would recommend the book The Sparrow by Maria Doria Russell. The plot line demands that you view belief, faith, with uh, our perception of our place in the world, who is good, who is bad, etc. That sounds really, really interesting. And you just read my, you just ruined my reading list, Huckleberry because I'm going to add that one to it. Uh, Russell. Okay, I'll add that one. That does sound really, really fascinating and really interesting. Um, okay, so I want to talk about something that came up, came up a little while ago. Um, we were talking about uh, we were talking about, uh, the Bible. We've been talking about the Bible for the last couple of weeks, actually, in, in various ways under with, you know, from, from various perspectives. And, um, then I think it was this past week, uh, I did a video, maybe it was last week. I did a video about IVF and about when conception, right? You know, so you know what happened with, in Alabama with IVF and then if, of course, the Republicans, Mike Johnson in particular, was interviewed about it. Do you believe that con you know that that life begins at conception? And you know, it, it did come back to me. I had a couple people say, "No, no, life begins at conception. That, that is life. Like you see the cell doing its thing, and and that it means it's alive. And therefore, da 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 da. All right. A lot of times when Christians will will fall back on the life begins at conception thing. Um, it, it comes from, it comes from a biblical understanding. It comes from a biblical perspective. There, there are scripture, there are scripture in, in, in the, in the script, yeah, there's scripture in the Bible, the verses in the Bible that talk about, um, you know, Je first Jeremiah, or not first Jeremiah chapter one, excuse me, where, where, uh, God is purported to be speaking to the prophet saying, before I knit you together in your mother's womb, I, I knew you, I appointed you, 
I, I was preparing you for this moment. Um, there's another passage, and we're going to read it. It's, it's from the Psalms, actually. Um, it's from Psalm 51. Now, I'm going to read you first. I'm going to read just, just pay attention to verses 5 and 6, right? Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness, even in the womb, you taught me wisdom in that secret place. Now, if you're reading that, you could say, okay, so if God knew me in the womb, if God desired my faithfulness, even in the womb, before I was having what I remember to be a conscious thought in that secret place, obviously, for God, that's where I, I, was, I, was, I was alive in that place, right? Before I was sinful from birth, therefore... Wow, I must have been a really awful person from birth. Uh, sinful from the time that my mother conceived me. So we hear this kind of language. We hear this kind of language. And we can, we can hear, when we hear this kind of language, we can drop into a place where we're saying to ourselves, okay, so even in the womb... I was known by God. Even at conception, I was known by God. Before I was even put together in the womb, I was known by God. So therefore, life must begin at conception. What, the minute we become alive is when God knows us. And when God knows us is at conception, therefore... Okay? But if you read the context... We read the context of this verse up until chat, up until verse six. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all of my iniquity and cleanse me from all of my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Now, if we read the context of what's going on, the author here is saying, Mea copa, mea copa, mea maxima copa, mea. Help me with missing the mark. Help me with my sin. Help me, help me to be obedient. Help me to live a productive life, a good life, a community life, a sacrificial life. Help me to live a life that, that is worthy of my faith in you. Help me to live a life that is, that is God-like and holy. Now, if we know that context, then we come to chapter 5 and 6. Surely I was sinful right from the time that I was born. Is that really what the author's saying? Or is the author saying, I've been sinful since before I can remember. Surely I have been sinful since before I can remember. And then he, he just sort of further, further extrapolates on that, on that metaphor. Surely I was sinful from birth since before I could remember. So I can't remember being, I can't remember when my mother conceived me, so I must have been sinful then. He's, he's extrapolating on this metaphor. He's, he's expanding upon it. He's, he's using words. He's using words to demonstrate how powerfully he feels about his, what he says is his sinful life. The English language all languages use metaphor, use simile, we use idioms to describe something to the community we're speaking to. And reading a passage like that, reading a passage from Jeremiah where God says, I, I put you together in your mother's womb, it's really, really dangerous for us to take that and read it literally. We should read it seriously, but to read it literally you know, at some times, you know, thinking that, wow, God knew me before he knit me together in my mother's womb is actually, that can actually feel like a, that's a really comforting thought to me from time to time. But not even in the literal. Just understand what it means. That's a really long time. I knew you before you knew me. 
I knew you before you were aware of me. I knew you before you had a conscious thought. I knew you and I knew that I had a plan for you for the longest time. That's what that passage is saying. But they're using metaphor to describe just how long that time actually is. We do it all the time in our language. It's been a dog's age since, since I've seen you. Like a dog's age? It's been seven years? It's been, you know, I don't know, what's a dog's age, right? That's a long time. You look like a million bucks. That's a great one. You look like a million bucks. Like a stack of cash? I look like a stack of cash? Oh, or do I look like a million male deer with, with their antlers? Is that what you're talking about? We use language to describe how we feel. We use language to describe what's going on in colorful ways because it draws the reader in and it lets the reader see that, okay, this is, it lets the reader feel something. Metaphor, simile, and all the other, all the other ways that we, that we mold and, and mold word, use words to, to, to mold thought. Um, we, we do it for purpose. The, authors, the author of this psalm was not saying, I was sinful since the time I came into this world. The author was saying, again, I was sinful since before. I, I, I've been sinful so long, I can't even remember when it got started. That's what he's saying. Again, and then he extrapolates on that because it's colorful language that brings the reader in and helps the reader feel what the author's feeling. And what the author's feeling is that they've messed up and that they've been messing up forever in a day. There's another one, forever in a day. Well, what's forever in a day? Really? The author has been sinful forever in a day? No, the author couldn't be sinful forever because he's not been around forever. But we use our language to colorfully bring people into the feeling that we have as we express it. We use language to, to colorfully describe things in order to engage the audience that's reading it. Again, I've known you since I've sown you, I, I, since I put you together in your mother's womb. I've been sinful since birth. That isn't to say, that has nothing to do with when life begins. It has nothing to do with, with, the, the, a fertilized egg. It has nothing to do with, with, with an embryo. It has nothing to do with the question of when is it that we, re, that we, that we become sentient? When is it that we become people? Nothing at all to do with that. That language is used to describe a period of time. It's to, dis, it's, it's to help the reader feel the emotion of the author. Think about, think about this. Let's say, let's say um, you write a book. And in that book, you use the term. You say, your car- Bob, Bob said to Jim, you look like a million bucks, period. End quotes. And you go on writing the rest of your book. Your book becomes a, a bestseller. Right? So there's copies of it everywhere. And then let's just say something cataclysmic happens and it's a thousand years before somebody ever finds your book again. And when they find your book and they start reading your book, they're not familiar with our colloquialisms. They're not familiar with our idioms. They're not familiar with with our speech patterns. They're not familiar with our, with our, with our metaphors and our, and our use of language to pull people in. And they look at that book and they go, wow, Bob said, Jim looks like a million bucks. Jim had the resemblance of a million male deer. Huh? That's something. What would that even, how would that look like? What would that, what does that mean to us? Jim must have been a a massive creature. He must have been, he must have been a huge being, right? He must have been so strong and so, st- 
come on. Right? Or Jim looked like a stack of, Jim looked like a million dollars. So he must have been square because that's the only way you can get a million dollars to stand up like that. He was, he was square and green and, and very papery. We're reading, when we read the Bible, we are reading things written. So first of all, we're reading things written thousands of years ago, translated into our language by people who are doing their best. So it's not perfect. Secondly, we're reading what's been translated by interpreters into our language from texts that were written from memory of what a lot of what a lot of scripture was an oral narrative. It was a, the, the stories being told orally, being shared through song and being shared by, by storytelling. They weren't written down originally, right? We know the word of God was not shared because God came down with pen and parchment at the time of the time of Moses and started writing all this stuff down. No, no, that stuff was all, was all spoken. And as every time it was spoken, it changed just, just ever so slightly. There's no way (laughs) <laughs> like there's no way we're getting scripture exactly right reading it where we are today there's just it's just i i can't see i can't envision how that's possible so for us to take it literally it's actually a really it's a kind of a dangerous thing for us to do we need to be aware we need to be aware of how we how we ourselves speak We need to be aware of how we ourselves tell our stories. We need to be aware of how we use metaphor and simile and idioms, how we use speech patterns, how we use, you know, colorful language in order to tell our stories. And we have to assume that those authors were doing the same thing. We have to assume that those storytellers were doing exactly the same thing as we are. And therefore, they were using language that we're no longer familiar with. They're using terms that we no longer use. They're using metaphor and simile that don't make any sense to us. They're using idioms and, and colloquialisms that simply do not translate into our, into our speech patterns. When we read the Bible... Ask yourself, ask yourself what, the, what feeling the author is trying to convey. Ask yourself what the theme, uh, the story is trying to convey. Ask yourself what, 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 what the author is, is, is responding to. You know, you think about the epistles. Every one of those epistles was written as a response to a particular situation that we are not privy to. Again, as I think it was Sarah mentioned and a, and a few other people have said it. Read it, embrace it, learn from it. Allow it to speak to you, allow it to comfort you, allow it to challenge you, allow it to transform you. But allow it to be what it is. Allow it to be what it is and, and, and come at it with the understanding that this is this is. Well, this is an ancient magic and it's beyond us. And all we're really able to do is the best we're able to do. And our best, our best is still, it's not going to, it's not, it's not going to be perfect. Amen. Uh, Marissa, this is interesting. Atheists have taught me more about what I believe than any church I've ever attended. Yep. Yeah. Questions are lovely, right? Questions are lovely. And when we have a faith, um, questions are lovely. And when we have faith, sometimes questions feel fairly, they almost feel, they feel unnatural right? They, they, they almost feel like it's some kind of betrayal of what we believe. And so we may not be the greatest of, 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 we might not be the ones to, who are going to ask the best questions. But an atheist, somebody from another faith, they'll ask us questions. And when they do, and if we're willing to embrace the question, 
uh, and really willing, willing to give it some consideration. Oof. Oh, the paths that we'll walk, the, the journeys that we'll take are amazing. So if you have, if you're lucky enough to have a, a person of, of another faith in your life who's challenging your Christianity, you know, gently, because nobody likes a jerk. But if, if, if you have an atheist in your life who, who is, is, is challenging and asking you questions about your, your faith journey, again, in a nice way, oh, give them a hug and give them a kiss. They are one of the greatest gifts that God has given you. Right? They, are, they are the greatest gifts that God has given you because they, maybe without even knowing it, they're going to lead you closer and closer and closer to the divine. Um, okay. We need to. Wow, it's 10.50? Oh, you people are amazing. Thank you for being here with me for this whole time. You are absolutely awesome. Um... <laughs> Veggie Hall Girl says, be vegan. Genesis 1 29. <laughs> uh, see, it, it, you know. Yeah. Uh, Aria says, I was told not to question. I never listened to it. Uh, I never list. I never listened. It's not in my nature not to question. Then you are blessed of God for sure. You are absolutely blessed of God. Virgil says, just so you know, Reverend, some of us don't comment uh, that we are here. I, yeah, I know. And we always pray anyway um, for the folks that don't comment. And I'm always aware that you're here, but I'm always very, very grateful that you're there. I really am. Um, yeah, it's lovely. Captain says, there are some atheists I follow on deviant art who struggle with depression and burnout, and I pray that God will be with them. Hmm. Excellent. Thank you, Captain. We'll be praying. Uh, Caitlin says, love listening to, the re to you, Reverend. I enjoy sharing uh, Saturday evening listening to you. That's awesome. Thank you for being here. Um, let's see. Prayer request from Josh. Continued prayer for Alexa Nicholas. And we should also pray for the former Nickelodeon stars who were traumatized by predators like Dan Schneider. Uh, uh, Brian Peck and Brian Robbins. Hmm. Let's pray. We're going to pray for child actors. For Alexa Nicholas. And for all who were abused, who used and abused. Um, Lori says, time flies when you're having fl fun, even with a broken clock. <laughs> I like that. Uh, Marissa says, the church tells me what I must think. Atheists ask me why I think. And, and really, I'll tell you what. Um, the church, its job should be to, to, tell, to, to ask you to think. We really should. We, sh we shouldn't be in the business of telling you what to think. We should be challenging what you think. Um, that's just me. Chris, thank you for being uh, Reverend Ed. Continued prayer for my aunt, Andrea, who may have lupus. We'll be praying for her. Thank you for your generosity, Chris. Thank you for your thank you for your generosity. Let's celebrate their 20th super on a live stream. That's fantastic. Brilliant. Cherry Ann, thank you for your generosity and for your your charity your charitableness. Uh, I don't know what that creature is, but its heart looks like it's jumping right out of its right out of its chest. There's another one. Right? I ran so fast it felt like I, I it felt like my heart was about to pop through my chest. Really? That's pretty fast. You must have, you must have been running really fast because you got ribs there. How could your heart possibly pump through your? Come on, man. Jeez. <sighs> um, let's see here.
Paul says, no matter how heinous to our human senses the assured sin is, the assumed sin is, excuse me, and in quotes, the assumed sin is, um, any and every sin is only for God to judge. Yeah. You know, I'm trying to figure out how to respond to a video I watched today. But the video was about uh, about someone who, who, you know, years ago, um, was convicted of doing something and they were guilty of it and they went to prison for it. And this video came out and is, you know, telling us about this person, despite the fact that the person for the last, you know, however, however long has sort of repented of that particular, that stuff. They, they're not doing that stuff anymore. They're not, they're not being the bad guy anymore. They're living a different life. And they're living a life that's admirable. And they're living a life that's that's decent. Right? Probably not perfect, but decent. I'm trying to figure out what it is that I want to say about a situation like that. Because, you know, it comes back to some of our conversations about, about judgment and about... Um, um, about forgiveness and about condemnation. You know, are we supposed to hold a person's uh, crimes against them for the rest of their life? Um, are we supposed to hold their sins against them for the rest of their life? Do we, do we force them to pay for the person they used to be for the rest of their life? When do they have to stop? When do they get to stop paying for their mistakes, for their choices? Right? Let's not, we're not trying to sugarcoat it like, oh, they didn't know. No, they knew. What, what, how long do you have to pay? How much, how much blood, how much, how much fat do we get to? How much flesh do we get to take? Do we always? It's, 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 you know, and, and these questions come up. So coming back to Paul, what Paul said about, about God's the only one who, can, who should judge our sin. I think that's ultimately where it comes from, right? When we place ourselves in a situation for whatever reason, whether it's natural or whether it's purpose driven or whether it's, it's it's instinctual, whether it's a matter of safety, whatever the case is, when we place ourselves in the judge's seat where we will condemn the people standing in front of us, now we have to continue, we have to answer all these other questions, right? It's not just about you sinned and you did bad and you're bad how long? What if they change? Can they ever change enough for us to accept them as, as a new person? Anyhow. Uh, William says, I am rebuilding my blue jean quilt. My mother made it in 1977 and I wore it out. Oh, that's lovely. That really, uh, that is really lovely. Uh, Andrew says, according to the Bible, we are supposed to forgive debt every seven years and not have to pay any interest. That's very true. Um, well, it's a little bit more complicated, but yeah, that's that's right. And every, well, uh, it's every 49 years we're, for, we're supposed to forgive all debt. All debt gets wiped out. Um, but yeah, and I don't think there's, I'm not sure if there's ever been a recorded jubilee. Um, we've talked about it in a Bible study from time to time. I'm not sure if there's ever been a recorded jubilee where that's actually happened. Um, I can't only imagine what it would be like. Uh, Stephen says, Cradle Catholic here. Very interesting and heartwarming. Completely understand what you see. That's nice. It's awesome. Thank you for being here. Uh, Seth says, I talked to a friend about Leviticus and he said it's almost impossible to live by those laws today. Pretty much everything will get you a death sentence according to those old laws. So touching on that, Seth, 
It's the same. If you run up to Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1 talks about how God gave people over to their sins and they did this and 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 they were deserving of death because of their sins. And and I know somebody's going to go, yes, and they, that was just the homosexuality. No, gossips are deserving of death according to their sin. Thieves uh, are deserving of death according to their sin. The reason, So as a Christian, we look back on that and we go, well, we can't possibly live up to all these laws. Even at that time, they couldn't possibly live up to all these laws. And, but that's why we count on God's grace. Right? That's why in, for the Christian life, Jesus and, and his sacrifice, his atoning sacrifice is so important to us because we can't, if we're, gonna, if we're going to, to measure our lives according to the Levitical standard, we will never, ever achieve. We will never we'll never get there, right? We'll never be obedient enough. We'll never be holy enough. We'll never be good enough, ever. And so we have God's grace. That's the point. God's grace gets us there. Why we can't see that? I, I just, I, it, it bothers me, especially from, again, I'm only speaking from a Christian perspective as that's what I know. It bothers me to no end when Christians hold the Levitical laws up against others without understanding that none of us get there without Jesus. And with Jesus, all of us get there. Just baffles me. Um, let's see. Okay, folks, let's jump into prayer and let's jump into Compline. Uh, Catherine says the book, the, see, I, I can't stop. You folks are so interesting. Catherine says the Bible is a library with books of multiple genre and purpose and styles from different like centuries separated by centuries and eons, right? The, authors who spoke completely who spoke what we think is the same language in completely different ways who used words that literally have no um no equal there's no word that we okay well they use this word and that means this in english so they say chair we say chair no, no like they're saying avocado shortening well, we don't have a word for avocado shortening. It's, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. The Bible, a long game of telephone. Yeah. Yeah. That's real. That's a really interesting way of, of, of putting it. Yeah. Kevin Johnson or the metaphor built like a brick house. That guy's, that guy's built like a brick house. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm just making sure that there's no, um, that I didn't miss a, a prayer request here. Folks, if I did miss your prayer request, my apologies. Uh, it will get to me and we'll, uh, okay. Aria says, whatever is wrong with my left leg, I needed my cane yesterday, but as the day went on, it got better. Uh, I just got up and almost fell. It's bad again. The test was normal, but it's not. We'll pray for you, Aria. Okay. On that note, on that note, let's, uh, oh, okay. I got them. Perfect. Okay. We're going to, um, we're going to jump into prayer. So <sighs> let's pray. Tonight, Lord, well, listen, we give you thanks. Thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for these questions. Thank you for the comments. Thank you for the comfort. Thank you for the challenge. Thank you for this church. And thank you for all these lovely, wonderful people, wherever they be found. We pray, Lord, that you would hear each prayer, that you would be present to those who are in need, that you would answer these prayers in a way that is most expedient to, to those who pray, especially, Lord, those prayers that we have missed, those prayers that we have forgotten, 
uh, those prayers that, that weren't uttered. And we, Lord, we pray for all those people who are here but never comment. Take care of them. Show them. Show them your love. Tonight, Lord, we also pray for Burnt and Solveig, uh, who, are, who are under the weather. We pray for Sarah and we pray for Emmanuel. We pray for Sarah in Iraq and Emmanuel in Sweden. We pray that Sarah's time in Iraq is becoming easier, less burdensome, that she's finding her way. We pray for Constantine in Uzbekistan, for his health and for his family, for his friends. We pray for Glenn and we pray for we pray for Glenn and we pray for Bill and for Larry who are all suffering from cancer. We pray for Allison's dad that he would continue to experience an abundant life that his health has stabilized and that he'll be with us for a long time. We pray for Amy from the Bible study as she continues to undergo treatment for her ailments. We pray for Cheryl and for Wolfgang for their, for their troubles, for their health. We pray for Justin and for his family and for, for his troubles. We pray for joy and peace and for what they're going through in life. Lord, we pray for Steph, our friend in Sweden. We pray for Freya. And we pray for Amanda, her mom, as she's expecting a little sister. We pray for my friend, who I just recently found out has surprisingly begun a journey into ministry. I pray not only that you would be present to them as they undertake this journey, but that you'd be present to me and to all of us who will be called upon to support them that we would have the words, we'd have the time, we'd have the energy, that we could be your hands and your words and your ears in this world for them. We pray for all those who are suffering from addiction, regardless of which stage of addiction they find themselves in. We pray for all those who are going through divorce and breakups, all those folks who find themselves alone or lost. We pray for those who, those, we pray for those parents who've lost children, but we also pray for their families and their siblings. We pray for we pray for Lynn and for her husband on their journey to their new home. We pray for God's presence with all those who who are burnt out. We pray for everyone who is experiencing anxiety, who are traumatized, who are afraid and scared who find themselves depressed and struggling as this election cycle continues to continues to move towards November. We pray for the people of Gaza that they would receive all the help that they need and we pray that if we can serve a role in providing for them that those opportunities would be clear to us and that we'd have the strength and the courage to embrace those opportunities. We pray for the people of Russia who, who are experiencing a terrorist attack this weekend. We pray for the families and for the friends of those who were lost. We pray for those people and those communities who will ultimately suffer for these terrorist attacks but had nothing to do with it. 
bombs and guns. They're indiscriminate. We pray for the people of Ukraine. May they be protected. We pray for all of our all of our disabled all of our handicapped all those people who find themselves excluded from from the community they live in in some way all those people who find themselves on the margins at the edge of our societies simply because they're put together a little bit differently we pray that they would know your presence that they would experience your touch and your gifts and your blessings. We pray for Peter LaRue, who recently suffered a brain injury. We pray that his surgery would be successful and that he'd, that he'd receive a full recovery. He'd make a full recovery. We pray for Vicky and Mike and for their family, including their pets for all that they're going through. We pray for Teresa for healing from her lifelong addiction to drugs. We pray for uh, Greg and for Kathy as Greg appears to be suffering from dementia. And we pray for everyone out there who, like Greg, is suffering from dementia Alzheimer's, and we also pray for their caregivers, for those who mourn their loss, for those who are struggling to learn this new reality, to live within this new reality. We pray for our eight Mick as she anticipates the arrival of her mom, who's going to spend some time with them. We pray for everyone's sanity, for everyone's patience. We pray that this would be a visit filled with love and support and encouragement and laughter, honesty. We pray for CJ, who's in a nursing home on the West Coast, and we pray for CJ's family. We pray for the family of Riley Strain, a young college a young college uh, girl, woman, who was found dead in Nashville. We pray for Reuben as he prepares to undergo chemotherapy. We pray for Allison. We pray for her knitting skills. Lord, bless her with an unexpected gift and talent for knitting. We pray for Aunt Andrea, and what looks like a lupus diagnosis, may she receive the treatment she needs to have a full, abundant life. We pray for young Brandon, who recently ended his life due to bullying at school and in his life. We pray that he finds himself in your presence where there is no weeping or gnashing of teeth. We pray that the pain that plagued him, that led him to his decision, has gone. That he knows nothing but peace and light and love and a life beyond all understanding. We pray for those who mourn his loss, his family his friends, especially his mom, Tanya. We pray for his classmates. And we pray for the bullies who took so much from him. We pray, Lord, we pray, Lord, that as they come to understand their role, that they would not be destroyed by this knowledge. But they would be built from this knowledge to be people 
of life, to be people of love and empathy, to be people of acceptance and inclusion, to become people of community, to become people of sacrifice. We pray for Kate Middleton, the Princess of Wales, and for her recent diagnosis of cancer. We pray that her treatment would be successful and that she would experience a full recovery. We pray for Donald Trump and for those who claim to be mega. We pray We pray for all of us in this moment, that all of us would see clearly what is being asked of us, that all of us would see clearly the path we are being asked to walk, not as Christians, but as citizens, as people, as humans. We pray that these political identities could be seen for what they are, a useless mask meant to protect us from our insecurities and our fears of inadequacy and and, and our fears of, of lack, fears of the lack of resources. We pray for all those who are running for elected office, pray for all those in elected office. We pray for Oscar's anxiety, that it would continue to dissipate. He would continue to to feel more alive as the days go on. We pray for Annette, that she would experience a full recovery after being hit by a car. We pray for Great Knitting's sister's health. We pray for the frustration of her family. We pray. We pray for that all of her sister's needs would be met and that her sister would be open, that they would all be open to the right, healthy, safest way forward. We pray for all survivors of abuse, however that abuse may have occurred. And we pray for all child actors, all those children that we rely on to entertain us. We pray especially for the ones who have been used by the system and abused by the system and by bad actors within the system. We pray especially for Alexa Nicholas as she continues her campaign of knowledge and of protest and of transformation. We pray for We pray for a 50-year-old nephew who's experiencing stage 4 cancer and for a 53-year-old nephew who's experiencing stage 4 cancer. We pray for their health and for their recovery. We pray for their resilience. And we pray for their families who are caring for them and loving them. And Lord, we pray for Aria for their left leg in particular. And though the tests came back negative, there seems to be something wrong. May this be resolved, Lord, in a way that is most expedient to Aria, that they can get back to living a vibrant life. We 
pray these things in the name of our Savior Christ. Amen. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and a perfect end. Amen. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Come unto me, all that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Into my hands, O Lord, into thy hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. Into thy hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. For thou hast redeemed me, O Lord, thou God of truth. My commend my spirit. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. Into thy hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. Before the ending of the day, creator of the world, we pray that with thy wanted favor thou wouldst be our guard and keeper now. From all ill dreams defend our eyes, from nightly fears and fantasies. Tread underfoot our ghostly foe that no pollution we may know. O Father, that we ask be done through Jesus Christ, thine only Son, who with the Holy Ghost in thee doth live and reign eternally. Amen. Keep us as the apple of an eye. Hide us under the shadow of thy wings. Preserve us, O Lord, waking and guard us sleeping, that awake we may watch with Christ and asleep we may rest in peace. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, to be a light to lighten the Gentiles and to be the glory of thy people Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Preserve us, O Lord, waking, and guard us sleeping, that awake we may watch with Christ, and asleep we may rest in peace. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Blessed art thou, Lord God of our ancestors, to be praised and glorified above all forever. Let us bless the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Let us praise him and magnify him forever. Blessed art thou, O Lord, in the firmament of heaven, to be praised and glorified above all forever. The almighty and most merciful Lord guard us and give us his blessing. Amen. Wilt thou not turn again and quicken us, that thy people may rejoice in thee, O Lord, show thy mercy upon us, and grant us thy salvation. Vouchsafe, O Lord, to keep us this night without sin. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us. O Lord, hear our prayer, and let our cry come unto thee. Lighten our darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord and by thy great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of thine only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Look down, O Lord, from thy heavenly throne and illuminate the darkness of this night with thy celestial brightness. And from the sons of light banish the deeds of darkness, 
Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Be present, O merciful God, and protect us through the silent hours of this night, so that we, who are wearied by the changes and chances of this fleeting world, may repose upon thy eternal changelessness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, it is night. The night is for stillness. Let us be still in the presence of God. It is night after a long day. What has been done has been done. What has not been done has not been done. Let it be. The night is dark. Let our fears of the darkness of the world and of our own lives rest in you. The night is quiet. Let the quietness of your peace enfold us, all dear to us, and all who have no peace. The night heralds the dawn. Let us look expectantly to a new day, new joys, new possibilities. The night heralds the dawn. The night heralds the dawn. Let us look expectantly to a new day, new joys, new possibilities. In your name we pray. Amen. We will lay us down in peace and take our rest, for it is thou, Lord, only that makest us dwell in safety. The Lord be with you and with thy spirit. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God, the almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Bless and preserve us all. Amen. <sighs> Thank you all for joining me for Compline. Thank you for spending this time with us here in the Church Without Walls tonight, even with our our mystical broken clock. Um, something. This is just occurring to me during those last prayers. Next Saturday is uh, Holy Saturday. It's the Saturday just before Easter. And at this time of day, we would normally, we would do what's known as Easter Vigil. So here's, I have a, I have a piece of homework for you. And if you accept this homework, you have to have this into me by Wednesday. At the latest, it has to be in by Wednesday. Here's the homework. If you have a prayer that speaks about, well, for example, we just read in, in, our, in, in that New Zealand prayer about the night heralds the dawn. Okay, so Easter is, we do Easter Vigil because it, it, it's the beginning, it's actually the beginning of the day, right? Nighttime is the beginning of the, the traditional Jewish day. So the night is, is, is about waking up into tomorrow and Easter is tomorrow and the life and the light and the sun comes up tomorrow. So if you happen to have a prayer that makes you feel that way, and I don't care what your tradition is, I don't care at all what your tradition is, it's going to have to be in English. But if you have a prayer that speaks to that, that speaks to hope, that speaks to, that speaks to the coming dawn, the hope that is found in a new tomorrow, those new possibilities that are waiting for us. If you have a prayer that speaks to that, I would love to receive it. Send it to me. And I will, next Saturday night, we're not going to do Compline. Um, we'll do a form. We'll do a form of Easter Vigil. And by that, I mean uh, a time when we rest in the expectation, when we gather in the expectation that tomorrow, oh, tomorrow is going to bring new things, good things, great things, amazing things. Okay. That's what we're going to do next week. Amen. Namultus, everybody. <laughs>